from that, would you turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 22. And just like a lot of my early recordings used to have the girls when they were little in the background making noises, now I've got my grandkids. And, uh, so <coughs> little Grace is adding little tones to this sharing. <coughs> First Chronicles chapter 22. Now it's been obvious from what we've been sharing uh, to this point that David saw the deep desire of God to have a habitation. Amen? From the pre previous sharings that we've had. That, that David had an incredible deep desire. I mean, he saw the deep desire of God to have us as a habitation. And it's also evident from what we've shared in the past that it was uh, through you know, personal experience and recent history and through the scriptures that there he saw, you know, his eyes were open and his heart was open to uh, this reality of us becoming his habitation and of God wanting and desiring and, if I may say, needing a habitation. Um, and it was because of this that, that God said that he loved David and called him a man after his own heart. What an incredible statement, amen? And, you know, all of that's true, but what I want to share today is <clears throat> about Solomon being brought into this purpose, amen? And, and David had this, but how was Solomon himself to be brought into uh, the purpose of providing God with a house? And um, so, first of all, we'll just read uh, 1 Chronicles 22, uh, verse 11. This is David talking to Solomon in front of the congregation. Now, my son, the Lord be with thee, and prosper thou, and build the house of the Lord thy God, as he hath said unto thee. In the first few words in the next verse, only the Lord give thee wisdom and understanding. And so the Lord wants to, <clears throat> wanted to prosper, and David wanted the Lord to prosper Solomon in relationship to building this habitation, because David wasn't going to be the one to do it, as you know, and as we've shared in the past. And so, um, now let's, let's look over in uh, uh, 1 Chronicles, uh, gosh, I flipped too far. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, just a few pages over. 1 Chronicles 29, and let's just read verse 1. Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great, for the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. Isn't, isn't that an, a, sort of an amazing thing? He said, for the palace. And a palace is where a king stays, right? <clears throat> for the palace is not for the king. <laughs> for the palace is not for man, but for God. It's, a pl it's his home. It's literally his home. And so David is, is saying that Solomon is yet young, and tender and um, you know when it comes to building this house of God when it comes to preparing it and that's what he's talking about here that he's young and tender he doesn't know his way this is all new for him but God is, has chosen him to do that um, and we know from the scriptures that David uh, to the end of his days had an utter passion to provide God with this habitation that he so desired um, but but God had chosen Solomon to be the one who would actually do the building and provide the, the permanent residence. May I put it like that? Because David provided Zion, which was still a tent. But Solomon was going to build this permanent residence. And um, uh, let's look in uh, Psalms. <clears throat> I've been in Psalms a lot, as most of you know. Psalm 138. Psalm 138, verses 1 and 2. And this, this along with, this is it towards the end of the Psalms, and we know from the life of David and everything that David maintained his zeal for the house of God right up to his last days. And in th this Psalm, verse, we'll just read verse 1 and 2, Psalm 138. 
I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. <clears throat> Here he's saying, I will worship toward, I worship, my worship is aimed toward this temple, this, this habitation. Do you see that? That that really is where he's saying, look, my heart is there because, why? Because God's heart is there. My, I mean, this is, this is a man after God's heart. Everybody's after God for what they can get from him. David is after God for what he can get for God what he can provide, what he can bring about. And so he's saying, look, my aim, my, my direction, my focus is toward God's house, toward God's temple. And he says, um, uh, and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, which he finds wrapped up in making us his habitation. His loving kindness and his truth is all wrapped up. In other words, what I'm saying here is, <clears throat> David's not just talking about general loving kindness that I had a flat tire and, and God sent somebody along that helped me. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, we, we praise God for all sorts of stuff and then we read into scriptures our setting, our life. We're the central focus of it. But, and we might even take these scriptures and do that. <clears throat> but David's central focus and, and his reality of God's loving kindness in that we're going to be his habitation. God's reality of the truth, thy truth, he calls it, <clears throat> that we're going to be a habitation and that more important than we're going to be a habitation, God himself is going to have this habitation. God's going to have a habitation. And so, you know, to, to the end of his day, to his dying breath, as he lay dying, his joy was that Solomon had built the temple and that God had, had come in. <clears throat> and so, um, let's, I want to, uh, uh, let me just say this. How did Solomon get this heart? How did he come to the same place that David was, or at least close to the same place that David was in relationship to building this house so that he actually built it? Well, let's uh, turn over to Proverbs chapter 4. And I'm going to run through several different Proverbs um, so that we can get an idea of this. Proverbs 4, beginning with verse 3. And I'm going to say that there, there are two main ways the Lord showed me that Solomon got it. One is he got it from David, his father. That one would be obvious that his father would try to implant that in him. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. And the second one we'll see as we get to those, the scriptures, which I think are more persuasive than even getting it from your father. Because, because why? Somebody can tell you the truth. And just because they tell it to you, even if they tell it to you over and over, doesn't mean you get it. Well, I don't know if I wanted that big amen because I'm telling it to you over and over. <laughs> I, don't, I guess you're not getting it. But anyway, uh, <laughs> Proverbs 4, let's uh, read verse, starting with verse 3. For I was my father's son. Well, who's his father? This is Solomon who wrote the Proverbs. David. <clears throat> tender. See, remember David said that. Tender. He's tender. He doesn't know these things yet. Tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. Who, who is his mother? Bathsheba. Oh, my God. I wasn't expecting that. Anyway, verse 4. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee, love her. She shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. And so David is <clears throat> relating to him, look, you know, you, and remember, we read the scripture. He said, oh, you know, arise, my son, build the house of God. Build a habitation for God. Um, 
only see to it that you get wisdom and stuff to know how to do this because it's not just make a shack or make a mansion. It's provide the habitation of his heart, the habitation that he wants, not the habitation that we think he might want. And so uh, here again, he's instructing him in that way. And let's go to the uh, Proverbs 1. <coughs> Proverbs 1. And starting in verse 20, we'll just read to the, to, uh, let's see, no, we'll read, I will read four verses. <coughs> Wisdom crieth outside. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She is crying, and it goes on the same again. She crieth in the chief place of the concourse and in the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? And, and the scoffers delight in their scoffing, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. And uh, I'm trying to get quickly through this so we can get to the main point. But let's go to Proverbs 9. Um, and this will be the last one in Proverbs. And in that last one, wisdom is crying outside, trying to, trying to bring them into something. Trying to bring them into the city. Trying to bring them into Zion. Trying to bring them into the reality of God. <clears throat> and then in uh, Proverbs 9, uh, verse uh, 1 through 2, starting with, wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. She hath killed her beast. That's the, that's the sacrifices. All taking place in the house by oneness with him in his self-giving nature. She hath killed her beast. She hath mixed her wine. She hath also furnished her table. <clears throat> and then, uh, let's see, verse 13 a foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing, for she sitteth at the door of her house. And I'll just leave it right there. The, the contrast of Proverbs 9 is the contrast of his house with our house. And we are fools, and we, get, we try to get people into our house, our understanding, our, our fix up, our dwelling, do whatever that pertains to us and our thing. But he starts with wisdom hath built her house. And this wisdom that David had built the house of God. If you understand what I mean. I know Solomon did. I'm saying. He, he is the one who gathered all the materials. He's the one who had it in his heart first. So he knew this. And so he's, he's saying, look, you won't even do this. Wisdom will do it. Once, once it comes, can, can I say amen? That there is a necessity of seeing. That's what we're calling wisdom. There's a necessity of seeing something. And, and the seeing can't be by teaching or by a preacher because I can sound, or, or let's just put it on David's name. David can sound just like any other preacher. Everybody's preaching. They're just, this is emphasizing that one. This one's emphasizing that. Right? And therefore, if you don't hear the difference, then it's just one good sermon or another good sermon or not, not a good sermon or whatever. <clears throat> but we're not hearing the heart of the Lord. And David heard the heart of the Lord. There's no question about it. You might question me, folks, but there is no question David got hold of the Lord in a precious way. And so all we've tried to focus on is what that was, that wisdom, that insight that David saw. Um, and now we're focusing on, in this session or this time, we're focusing on... <clears throat> how that got communicated down to Solomon. And so we can, we, we can clearly see that David is doing his very best to pass this down to his son. He know, I mean, you know, early, when he said, I'm going to build a house, the prophet said, do all that's in your heart, left, and then came back a little while later and said, oh, hold it, sorry, I spoke too soon. You're not going to build it, but your son Solomon is. Well, you know, David, you know, most of us would say, if God said you can't build it, we, we'd just quit. David didn't quit. He got the blueprint. He got all the materials. And then he let Solomon put it together. But we would just quit and say, well, God said I can't do it. So, you know, 
David said, I will get as close to what I can do. I will get as close to God. I will nudge up right up against it. We say, well, you're going to violate the will of God. He, he, no, I'm not. But I will do every stitch of every little thing I can do. You know, if he says no to me, that doesn't mean no to everything. You know, and it's, it's just a precious heart, folks. You know, we and so I'm, I'm saying we are... David's son. We are Solomon. We're the ones that are supposed to be helping to build this house and bring it about because, yes, we are the house too, but we are helpers together in this, if you understand what I'm saying. And so, um, so, so the initial uh, sharing came from David, and yet David was saying, get wisdom. He, he was saying, listen to my words, but he was also saying, get wisdom. Do you see the significance of that? One is, I will, t I will plant the seeds, but God has to give the increase. Okay? All right. So that being settled, David can only do so much. That needs to be understood. Something's going to have to give in relationship to, uh, to Solomon. <clears throat> and... Uh, and I believe at, at these early stages when he, David's talking about Solomon, he's young and he's tender and he doesn't know exactly how to build a house of God, that um, the insight and, uh, you know, and the heart for such an incredible task as building this habitation for God was not in Solomon for many years until God set Solomon up as king. Okay? All right, you with me on that? Uh, I'm, not say, I'm not saying do you fully understand. I'm just saying that began to turn things. Let's go to 1 Kings, and then we'll see how this fits in. 1 Kings, chapter 3. The reason why I'm speaking fast and feel like I'm going through this is because uh, the alternative is I share slow, and then we end up having another session tonight, and I don't know if you want to do that, so I'm going to try to get it all in this morning, Lord willing. <clears throat> all right, First Kings chapter 3, um, verse, starting in verse 1. And Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Does that sound wise and smart and a good idea? No, okay. Um, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had finished building his own house and then and the house of the Lord. In other words, she was brought in before all of this was finished. The wall of Jer Jerusalem round about. Only the people sacrificed in the high places because there was no house built into the name of the Lord until those days. So we see that Solomon was not fully with it at this point. He is king now. He is king. But just becoming king doesn't settle it. Can I get an amen? Just becoming king doesn't settle it. All right. So, however, this, there was this pressure. There was this thing. Um, Solomon, one of the things it says when Solomon was born is that God loved Solomon. Did you know that? It said God loved Solomon. And I got news for you. Solomon loved the Lord, too. Okay? He was a mess. But Solomon loved the Lord. Do we have any Solomons here? <laughs> that you love the Lord. You may be a mess, but you love the Lord. <clears throat> All right. But, you know, the prospect of being king just was weighed heavily upon Solomon. And uh, so in verse 4, we begin to see something that uh, began to take place. This is right after we finish reading about the high places and stuff. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statues of David. Not in, you know, not in his own thing, but in David as much as he could, his father. Only he sacrificed and burned incense in the high places. So he's not, he doesn't have it together yet. <clears throat> Verse 4, and the king went to Gibeon. Now, who knows another name for Gibeon? Shiloh. Okay. What's in Shiloh? The tabernacle, Moses' tabernacle. Okay. 
And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar in Gibeon. Uh, in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and said, Ask what I shall give thee. And so Solomon, this thing is weighing heavy on him. He's not only king, he's the one that God said, you're going to build a house of the Lord and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> and so he's being weighed down with this. So he goes to Shiloh or Gibeon. And he goes down there to offer sacrifice unto God and to find help and to seek the Lord's counsel in relationship to, to what am I going to do and, and uh, how am I going to carry this load and everything. And while he was there seeking the Lord, God appeared unto Solomon and he asked him, what do you desire as king? Okay, <clears throat> and that's what we just finished up on. Um, and then verse 6, and Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness. Now, this may not be obvious, but he's saying, he's saying, look, I've watched my father all, all the life I've been born, and you have given him great mercy and truth uh, according as he has walked before you in truth and in righteousness and uprightness of heart. Well, what is the heart about David? That he had a heart after God. So he's actually making a direct reference to specifically, I've seen how you've worked in my father's life. I've seen the, the heart that he has. I've seen the mercy you gave him in allowing him to walk in this particular way of spending his whole life uh, relating to a habitation for you and everything. And um, so he, he's, he's deeply affected by that. And he knows he doesn't have it because he's offering up in high places and marrying Pharaoh's daughter and all this for the good of the kingdom, but ends up being bad later. Amen? Okay. So, so he knows he's got a problem and he knows David's got something he doesn't have. He knows his father does. <clears throat> and an uprightness of heart with thee, and thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And he's talking about himself. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant, talking about himself, king instead of David my father. And I am but a little child. Do you see? He's totally aware. My God, I don't, I'm nothing like David. Anybody ever feel that way? I'm nothing like David. Well, then if you're more like Solomon, let's, let's try to find out what it was that why God loved him. And he did love the Lord. You can't say he, was, he was, didn't love the Lord. <clears throat> so he says, I'm just, I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. <laughs> I mean, he, this guy, is, that's getting low. He knows that he's got need. <clears throat> and thy servant is in the midst of thy people whom thou hast chosen, a great people who cannot be numbered or counted for multitude. Give, therefore, thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy great people? Okay? And so, um, well, let's, let's finish reading the prayer here. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing, and God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast thou asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee, and I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee in all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandment as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy life. So, um, you know, he's seeking the Lord. He's, he's, he, he has this desire and he asks the Lord for wisdom. And... Uh, <clears throat> He, uh, God says immediately, I mean, verse. look at verse 12. Behold, I have done, I have done according to thy words, okay? 
Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart. Okay? You see that? I mean, that's important that you see that when he asked, God gave it to him. Okay? And then Solomon arose from this situation. Man, he is just thoroughly blessed. Amen? I mean, this was weighing heavy on him. And he is just thoroughly blessed from this encounter with God. But then Solomon does a strange thing. A very strange thing. And we find this in the very next verse, okay? Verse 15 that we didn't read. We only read the 14. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all his servants. That, that was strange. It says that he goes up to Gibeon or Shiloh and he's offering up all these offerings and stuff and he offers a thousand offerings. And then he says, you know, God appears to him and says, what do you want? And he says, man, I need, I need wisdom according to what David had and everything and I don't have it. And how, you know, I need, you know, I need your help. And God says, okay, I've given you wisdom. And he gets up and he goes to Jerusalem. And he stood before the Ark of the Covenant. Well, first of all, most people die when you stand before the Ark of the Covenant. Thank God David established Zion, which was nothing but a tent with the Ark. It was the habitation of God. And he walked right in, stood before the Ark of the Covenant, and then he offered he offered unto the Lord. Well, why are you repeating this? Why are you going through this? Why are you backtracking and all this stuff? Just look at his heart. In order to, to seek God with all of his heart, Solomon initially, his first inclination was to go down to Shiloh and to offer sacrifices unto the Lord. That was his first inclination. But Immediately after his encounter with the Lord, uh, how many of you really need an encounter with the Lord? Not too many, but... <laughs> My God, it changed everything for him. It changed everything. And immediately after his encounter with the Lord uh, and with you know, God being there at Shiloh, he arose... And he went to David's tabernacle, where the Ark of the Covenant was, and he began to re-offer. He began to re-offer. Well, what precipitated this? Let's look over in, uh, let's, well, go on down, uh, let's see, 1 Kings. Let, let's go to 1 Kings 4 and verse 29. First Kings 4 and 29. <clears throat> and God gave Solomon wisdom and very much understanding and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt. And he was, uh, and he was wiser than all men, than Ethan, the Ezra, uh, and Heman, and Kolkol, and Darda, the sons of Mohal, and his fame was in all nations round about. So immediately when Solomon prayed, God responded and gave him a wise and understanding heart. And now, once he arises from that encounter there in Shiloh, he has godly insight from the Lord. And he saw that there was a tabernacle at Shiloh, amen? But there was something missing. There was something missing at Shiloh. What was it? The Ark of the Covenant, or the presence of God. Or in the, it, but more importantly, we're going to say the Ark because the presence of God was there. I mean, clearly, God was in that place in, because he met with Solomon there, right? God was in that place, but the ark wasn't in that place. 
And this is important because you don't want to mix up just the presence of God and the ark of God where he inhabits and where he lives, and therefore that ark was the one that they were looking for a place of rest. All right? God is everywhere. You agree? You, I, I believe you can find God in a bar. I'm not encouraging you to go look for him, but I'm just saying, I believe that you can, you can find God there. Um, you know, Shiloh was a place that God had set up, but something was missing, and it was no longer a habitation of God. Do you understand? Shiloh was no longer a habitation of God. It had become a, a religious edifice. It had been turned into that. But ever since the time that um, the Philistines took the ark and then David got it back from them and set it up in Zion, Shiloh was Moses' tabernacle without God having a habitation there anymore. All right, that's important to understand. Um, so let me just give you a New Testament reference here. Uh, John chapter 2. Let's look in John chapter 2. So we can begin to see this in light of us and, and begin to apply this in our own life. Um, let's start at verse 16. And said unto them that sold, this is Jesus speaking, and said unto them that sold doves, take these things from here. Make not my father's house an house of merchandise. In other words, it wasn't being a habitation. It was being merchandise for whatever. And he goes on to say, and the disciples remember that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Jesus didn't just go in, listen carefully. Jesus didn't go into the temple and drive out the money changers simply because the money changers were bad. He didn't go in there and drive out the sheep and goats simply because it was not, you shouldn't do that here because of this or that or whatever. The zeal of the Lord's house was eating him up. This is supposed to be God's house. What are you doing bringing all this stuff in here? Do you see that? The issue was not the zeal against sin have eaten me up. Is that clear enough? I mean, we always make it something else. But this was clearly, in Jesus' mind, this whole thing has been about a habitation, and even the shadow you mess up. So now he's about to speak, but he's not going to speak of the shadow anymore. He's sick, getting sick of the shadow. <clears throat> and so, verse 18, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? In verse 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was the temple building, and wilt thou raise it up in three days? Verse 21, But he spoke of the temple of his body. He's not wrapped up in the shadow. He's not into the shadow. He's not even in a certain sense defending the shadow. He's defending the truth of the habitation of God. Do you see how important that is? And he's speaking of the temple of his body, and they don't see that. They, number one, they see the temple as a religious edifice, not as a habitation of God. And they don't see it as his body. They see it as, you know, whatever, something for them. All right, so um, in, in, in a spiritual sense, for years we honor Shiloh. For years, we, all, we honor Shiloh uh, because it's, the, it's, a, been, it's become an edifice set up for our religious activities, our worship. We're talking about Solomon first going to Shiloh and then leaving there after he got wisdom from God and going to Zion. Are you with me? For years we go to Shiloh and we worship because it's a religious edifice and that's how we see it and we do all of our religious things and stuff. 
But one day God gives us wisdom and insight from above. And we begin to see the heart of God. And we say, you know what? That's not what it's about. God wants to live in us. Christ in us is our hope. And the zeal for the Lord's house begins to eat us up. Well, some of us, some of you don't look too excited about it, but, but some of us, that zeal for his house. I mean, you know, it's one of the only times, people say it's one of the only times Jesus got angry. They don't understand. You know, they're going against the very principle of Christ in you, and he's against that. You know. <clears throat> anyway, I, I get carried away, too. I think the zeal of the Lord's house eats me up many times, and I, you know. So, you know, we see the church as a place for us to serve God, right? And, and a building for our religious involvements. And so we just keep going to Shiloh. We keep going to Gideon. We keep being involved with that, you know. But let me tell you, something moved Solomon. It moved him from Shiloh to Zion. And what was it? divine wisdom from above that came into a man on this earth. Hallelujah. He went and he left Shiloh and he came to Zion and he offered. Here's where the true offering goes up. This is what it's all about. Um, and you can see that in Ephesians. We've referred to this scripture before, but how can you not? And I, there's a specific thing I do want to bring out in uh, Ephesians chapter uh, 2. Let's see here. <clears throat> Ephesians 2.19 <clears throat> Now therefore we are no more strangers and sojourners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built and are built and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, all the building, in whom all the building, we are built, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. I mean, can you get any more words? Built, building, uh, um, uh, uh, habitation, um, uh, temple in the Lord. It's all the same thing, and it's all saying you exist that Christ may exist in you. You don't exist for him going, oh, I love little Christians running around and, and praying little prayers and messing up all the time. Well, you, as it, if, if I was up from above looking down on it, it looked like that pretty much, you know. And, and when they get in trouble, they run to me. How sweet. But otherwise, they pretty much just, all right. I see that I'm, I'm meddling now. <clears throat> All right. So with, with wisdom from on high comes a realization that God wants a habitation for himself. And that's this wisdom that Paul's always preaching and speaking about. And, and that he's not wanting a structure for our religion to be carried out. That's so important. That's Shiloh. All right? <clears throat> Solom Solomon quit honoring the religious view. <laughs> he quit honoring the religious view of the house of God, didn't he? he? He did. He quit and he moved from it. And he moved to honoring the house of God as a place for God's own habitation. The Lord does not just want a tabernacle or a temple, the Lord wants a home for himself. And if, if he doesn't have that, there is no testimony. I won't get into that, but that's the testimony is that the ark is in its resting place. The true testimony, the full testimony, is that the ark is in its place. And so... Um, you know, this, this becomes about finding what God really wants. If you go, okay, if you go to Shiloh, go down there to Shiloh, okay, just like Solomon did, walk around, watch what's going on. There are all sorts of activities that God set up. 
they're all being carried on by the priests at Shiloh. Am I right or wrong? There's all sorts of activity. Can I call it godly activity in that concept, the concept of Shiloh? All sorts of things going on. And, um, you know, there are, you know, just like today, really. I mean, there are many activities and many godly ministries being carried on by a multitude of church, churches around the globe. <clears throat> but like Shiloh, they have lost the primary purpose for which the temple exists. They've lost the primary purpose, which is to be a habitation. It's just like Shiloh where the ark isn't even there anymore. Again, is God there? Yes, he showed up to Solomon down there. But when he showed up, Solomon left there. <laughs> Praise God. So, you know, and, and many of the groups that are, that are gathering at Shiloh, they have been set up and they've been organized around other areas of tabernacle furniture because there are other areas, are there not? There's the, there's the altar of incense, I mean prayer, and there's the, the light, there's the candlestick, and there's the bread, and you know, bread of life church, and light of the world church, and everything, you know, pray, you know prayer, tabernacle, and all that. They're all, they're all set up around other furniture that is still at Shiloh. But the ark isn't there because it is not a habitation that God wanted. And so he draws those away to what's really, truly what's in his heart. And a lot of churches are not set up primarily as a habitation of God. That the people would be a habitation of God. It's not even hardly mentioned to, to a lot of people. Look in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter... Uh, six. <clears throat> First Corinthians six and verse yes. Well, it's absolutely the truth because because then we're coming to services we're getting involved with things but we never like Solomon hear from God because but because th I'm, I mean with all my heart I'm trying to say something here consider Solomon before he saw this he wanted he saw listen he saw in his father a relationship that he thought, my God, that's incredible. How does he get that? He's king. Good thing he's got it. But I'm fixing to be king. And I can't handle this. And he said that. I'm like a little child. I don't know how to go out or come in. How can you? Don't put all this on me. I don't. I've, I see in him. I see in David. I see this heart after you that, that just wants only what he wants. And I don't have that. And so he goes down to the only place he knows, and he'll always do, you'll always do that. You'll always go to the, the religious place until you see the reality. And you'll continue to go there until you see the reality. So that's hopefully confirming what you're saying there, that we can do the same thing here. Yes. And let's face it, folks, until we have that wisdom, that's where we'll be found. I mean, let's face it. And, and that's not a sin unless we're not seeking with all of our heart to have this insight. And, and, and uh, you know, I'm just going to give a personal thing right here. I don't normally try to do that. But, but let me tell you something. When I, you know, when I began to see the heart of David, that what, how he was and what he saw and the way that he lived his life, I was crushed by 
the fact that I didn't even really have that kind of a heart. And I just so wanted that, that you know, you could say to be like David, but it wasn't. It was just to have that kind of a heart. And, um, and when God began to open that heart in me by showing me, you know, David's heart and then his heart, then a freedom came because then it's not rules, it's not teaching, it's not doctrine, it's not going to some church, whether it's this church or any church. Folks, we're not talking about praying or being happy or God will bless you or God will let you go buy a nice car or God will give you nice things. We're not talking about, we're talking about giving God exactly what he wants as a habitation. Maybe we fall short in a lot of those areas, but folks, we're trying to find the heart of God with all of our heart, soul, and strength. I mean, I know I am, and I believe many of you are that way. And so, but how? But how? how will we get that unless we first see someone that's got it? And that's not enough. You have to see yourself and see if you don't have it. And if you don't, then that'll make you go down. And even though you're offering in the wrong place, God will see your heart. Okay? All right, so 1 Corinthians 6 and verse uh, 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple? Okay, let's just stop right, that, right there. He says, what? With a question mark behind it. What? You don't have this knowledge that you're the temple? You haven't had this insight imparted? I mean, this is the way Paul speaks a lot. Really, in a lot of veins, and he uses it a lot over this temple thing. This is not the only place. There are about four different places in First and Second Corinthians where he goes, what? It's almost like he's, you know, then you're not even at Zion yet. You know, uh, don't you know? And that, he says it, don't you know that you're... You're the temple of the Lord. And he says this, you were bought with a price. Folks, you were not bought. Your body was bought. Really? Your body was bought. Now you consider that, but your body was bought because you're crucified with Christ. And yes, you are one with him, but he didn't buy you in that sense. He bought your body so that he would have a temple. And I, you know what? One of the other sessions when I get down the road, I'll just show you that. I'll just take you through the New Testament, and I'll show you, bam, 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 for a body thou hast prepared me. Bam, 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 you know, uh, on and on and on. Just I'll show you that, the, that really and truly he wanted a habitation, and guess what? Your body is a member of that. No, but that's another time, another place. Um, so, so he's saying, you know, you're using your body as if you're in control. You're the master. You live there. That's what he's saying. Did you hear? He's saying, you're not living like a temple. You don't, you don't really realize that. Uh, even the scripture there says, um, uh, for you're bought with a price, verse 20, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And if you'll notice, many of you will either have that left out or a little marginal reference saying, in your spirit was not in the original manuscripts. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit. The words in your spirit is not in most of the uh, manuscripts that they had, just your body. Somebody added it later on, okay? Which makes sense <clears throat> because he, it just said up here earlier, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Well, who is that spirit? That's the Lord. Your spirit has been meshed in, and now if you've got a spirit, it's his spirit within you, and you're one with that, united. That's what the scriptures say. All right, so if we're going to gain true wisdom uh, and understanding and insight like Solomon did, and we're going to get it, we will, this is not, you don't have to instruct anybody. We will leave the former structure, and we will come to Zion, the Zion of God's heart. Not the, not the Zion of New Creation Fellowship or the Zion of Randy Nussbaum or the Zion of Acts Bible School or, you know, the one of the Lord's heart. And, you know, well, why then? 
Why will we do that? Because we will see what is God's priority for ourselves. We'll see what's, and we'll be moved by that. And we'll see that uh, it rests with us being his habitation. Will we accept the cross and our death with him, not just because, well, there's all this death and all this junk and all this stuff. No, he must increase in this temple and I must decrease. This is his house and doggone it, I've been taking up too much room. I was sharing in, in um, uh, Arizona and I said, you know, we invite Jesus in our heart and he lives in our heart and we give him that little space right there and he's supposed to have the whole habitation and we say, well, whatever you do, you know, you don't go upstairs, that's my area. You know, that's kind of the way we do the Lord. You know, the, I'll give you this one room. We're roomies. You get a room. But the upstairs is all mine. Don't mess with anything up there. I control the vertical. I control the horizontal. You know? <clears throat> all right. So this thing of being a habitation, when you see that insight from the what? Know ye not? This begins to override everything. Yes, it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't void out the other. Do you understand what I'm saying? It doesn't void out that. But why would I, wanna, why would I want to emphasize the, the, less, the, the minors, major on the minors, and leave out the major thing? Why would I want to do that? Well, so you can fit in with all the other churches. So you won't get accused of being out of balance by preaching Christ or preaching the cross. I don't, that's been, you know, 40 years of that. I'm, that doesn't bother me. I mean, I'm willing to stand before the Lord and somebody go, all he ever preached was, well, was you and the cross, the lamb there. That's all. Never mind. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. I can wait. I don't, I don't mind what's being said now. But I believe with all my heart that we're on the right track here. But our hearts must, must be awakened, folks. We're in a time period between now and the end of next year where God wants to do more than just stir us in a service or buy a message, but bring us into a whole, well, to, to separate us from Shiloh, like was said, because I believe that is good, and bring us into Zion. In a real way, in an, in, a, in an understanding that is like walking into a whole new realm with the Lord. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. So, no, are, are we there yet? No. Have we barely started? Just kind of barely. But can't you, even if we're not there, be praying? Can't you think about it when you're driving down the road and start praying for, for the rest of this year and the, all of next year? Can't we just give ourselves, if nothing else, in prayer? Let's just say we'll pray that God will have his habitation and let the judgment of that begin in the house of God with us. The zeal of the Lord come let it drive out everything that is not him that has taken up room in his habitation. All right, so, you know, uh, Colossians 1.27. Christ in you, you know it. Christ in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And what Solomon had his eyes opened unto that caused a change of allegiance, can I use that phrase? what caused the change of allegiance to which temple that he would go to was not that just that God was no longer in the tabernacle of Moses. It wasn't just that. That that structure had lost the primary purpose of God. And that was the wisdom that he saw. It's lost the primary purpose of God for its existence. Can you imagine them carrying on all that activity for God and God ain't even there? In the, in the sense that we're talking about. You understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying God isn't in all. I'm just I'm saying they've, I am saying this. They've lost the primary purpose for their existence. You say, well, that's your opinion. Well, I hope it's God's opinion. I mean, what I mean is I believe it's God's opinion. And, and 
what kind of person would I be, personally me, if I believed that this was the primary thing in God's heart and didn't press it forward? What kind of person would I be? At any cost, what kind of, if everybody hated me, what kind of person would I be if I really believed it? Well, I'd be a hypocrite or I would be fearful and moved by everything else. I believe with every fiber of my being that we are on the right track with this habitation thing. With every fiber of my being. And so, you know, and obviously Solomon did too when he got up and said, well, I'm leaving this, man. This is, this is dumb. God just told, God told me get out of here. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> and to press forward, hallelujah. Um, <clears throat> and, and we will when that wisdom comes. Don't do it because I say so. Don't do it because it's preached around here. But we will leave a religious form in order to find a dwelling place for God. We will do that when it's, in our, when it's seen in our hearts as what it really is. All right. So, let's face it, many Christians are involved with a variety of concepts, um, and those things are of God, but again, it's not, you know, again, something is missing. If they could admit it, if we could admit it, something is missing. Um, that's it. I'm going to try to wrap this up here. God help me. This ain't going to happen. I'm just going to look at my notes here and just try to read some because I don't think you want to be drugged through this another hour tonight, do you? Nah. Oh, God. Would you be all right if we went for another hour tonight? I'm sorry. I genuinely tried to get through this, but, but I... I believe that this is something that will wash us and water us, and there are seeds in us. There are seeds in you that God has planted totally apart from this place and apart from me. Places along your life, even before you came to the Lord, that God was planting things. And, and maybe this is the rains that are starting to come to bring forth. I mean, we're always trying so hard to bring forth. Maybe this is the rains. Maybe this will do it. And I, I would hate to miss that for your sake, from, for God's sake, if that be the case. So let's, let's close with a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll do that tonight. Father, we just so long for you to speak to us in our place at Shiloh and open our heart and give us, Lord, you said give us largeness of heart there. That's what you said you gave to Solomon, largeness of heart. Lord, you dwell in our heart. We want more room. Largeness for us isn't something greater in us. It's more room for you. Lord, that we need you to speak. And Lord, even if our spirit bears witness that this is the truth, we are like Solomon. We are afraid of putting us in charge because we know we're just like little children. We don't know how, how to go in and out. Open our eyes. Show us what's missing. Show us what we need to do. Bring us more to you. Bring us right in. Through that, through those, those hangings into Zion and like Solomon that we may stand before the ark without fear because that's your place and we're just visiting you there. Father, we ask this and more, much more, according to things we yet don't know we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you.